If a bunch of enormous titans turned the entire planet into their own personal battleground, what the hell would you do? Scientists have spent decades trying to understand these ancient creatures, but when a three-headed dragon escapes and starts waking up all of his friends, it's up to Godzilla and Mothra to team up with humanity and save the world. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat every single titan in Godzilla King of the Monsters. This woman's plan is about to backfire in the biggest way imaginable. It's been five years since Godzilla's fight with the Mudos turned the entire city of San Francisco into a giant crater. And this monarch scientist, Dr. Emma Russell, has just finished building a device that is going to change everything. When she and her daughter Madison are having their breakfast, the entire house suddenly begins to shake from unexpected activity at a nearby Titan containment outpost in the rainforests of China. And it's finally time to put her new creation to the test. Deep in the caves below the pyramid, a giant radioactive blue egg is about to hatch. Holy as the two of them watch from the observation deck, the insectoid titan known as Mothra finally emerges for the first time. The scientists immediately activate the laser containment grid until suddenly the entire system goes down without any explanation. This time, it's not the Titan causing the problems, but it seems like the facility has been sabotaged from the inside. Realizing that Mothra is becoming frightened, Emma orders the containment team to stand down, but in the confusion, this one dumbass decides to shoot her with a taser. And that was his biggest mistake. Defending herself, Mothra begins covering the facility in her strong silk webs, immobilizing the containment team without killing them. One of the scientists immediately moves to put Mothra down for good, but Emma quickly grabs her new device and runs into the chamber. The device, called the Orca, allows her to communicate with the creature using bioacoustics. It takes a moment for her to get it right, but Emma finds the correct frequency just in time. And suddenly, Mothra becomes docile, as if she can tell that they aren't a threat. It could be the most important breakthrough in scientific history, but just then, a team of PMCs led by former British Army Colonel Alan Jonah storm the facility, taking out everyone except for Emma, Madison, and the Orca as Mothra escapes into the rainforest. It looks like Emma's colleagues were right about the sabotage, and getting his hand on the Orca is only the first part of Jonah's master plan. Okay, what a disaster. I don't know what's worse, the fact that Monarch still doesn't seem to have learned their lesson after what happened back in San Francisco, or that Emma here decided to host her own bring your daughter to work day at a top secret Titan containment facility. To be fair, I was just as surprised as anyone when Twin Lannister blew the doors down and started lighting people up. But even without Jonah getting involved, they had no idea what was about to come out of that egg and if it was gonna be friend or foe. Probably not the best place to bring a 12 year old kid, all things considered. It looks like the cat's out of the bag now, or should I say, the giant larva is out of the radioactive egg sac. Meet Mothra, a titan from the order Lepidoptera. That's a fancy way to say butterflies and moths. At 50 feet tall, about the length of a semi-truck trailer, she's admittedly not the most impressive titan that we've seen so far. But remember, this is only her second form. Given time, she'll find a safe place to cocoon herself before growing into her final adult stage. Even as a larva, she's still capable of causing plenty of damage, as the monarch scientists have just witnessed firsthand. Her giant size allows her to crush puny humans like an egg, along with her several pairs of arms ending in pointed hooks, sharp jaws, and the ability to fire super strong silk webs, making her pretty much a formidable enemy in a fight. Or at least, they would, but the good news for us is that Mothra here is actually a friend. She may look terrifying, but the truth is that Mothra wouldn't have attacked in the first place if the containment team hadn't zapped her. Even when she could have killed them, she chose to take them out safely with her webs instead, proving that not only is she friendly, but she'll even go out of her way to avoid hurting humans whenever possible. And uh, that's pretty chill. Now, it is possible to injure her with enough force. Just like all bugs, fire usually does the trick, but maybe it would be a better idea for the Monarch team here to learn from their mistakes 
and focus on getting along with her instead of looking for a fight. Speaking of mistakes, this station really needs to upgrade their security. I mean, seriously, this guy Jonah just waltzed right in, set a Titan loose, and stole possibly the most dangerous device in the world without anyone even putting up a fight. As soon as she realized what was happening, Emma should have destroyed the Orca before it fell into the wrong hands. She could always rebuild it, and plus, that would give Jonah a reason to keep her and Madison alive at least until she made a new one. Better yet, why not use the Orca to tell Mothra to fight the bad guys? She could have made short work of them with her webs, but soon we're gonna find out that Emma here has her own reasons for what she did. If Jonah is planning to actually use the device, then he's going to have to attack another one of the outposts. And it seems like you need to be within a certain range of the creature for the Orca to work. Otherwise, why would Emma have risked getting so close? This could get out of hand fast, so until Jonah is stopped, Monarch leadership should immediately put all of their other outposts on ultra high alert. In the meantime, they should check Emma's notes to see if there is any way to trace or track the Orca, like a built-in tracking device and request help from the military in any country where they have an outpost, since these titans falling into the wrong hands represents a serious global threat. Hey everyone, do you miss the thrill of casting a line, the peace of a quiet lake, the excitement of reeling in a monster catch? Well, even if you don't live near water, you can still experience all that and more with Fishing Clash. I remember being a kid, tagging along with my grandpa to his favorite fishing spot. The anticipation of the bite, the fight of the fish, the joy of landing a whopper. It was pure magic, and now, thanks to Fishing Clash, I can relive that feeling anytime, anywhere. This isn't just any mobile game, folks. It's a full-fledged fishing experience with everything that you could ask for. Team up with friends and compete in exciting challenges in the brand new clan games. Build your own fishing village and customize your dream fishing haven. Oh, and there are tons of fish species from bass and trout to exotic catches. There's something for everyone. Explore stunning real world locations like the Cape Town Greenland and the Florida Keys. And upgrade your gear, reel in the big ones with top of the line equipment. And get this, Fishing Clash is now an official sponsor of the Angler of the Year Awards. That's right, real life fishing meets mobile gaming in a way that you've never seen before. I can't even believe some of the real life events happening in the US will be replicated in the game with the same locations, where players can take part in virtual competitions and win in-game rewards. Ready to cast your line and join in on the fun? Download Fishing Clash now on your iOS or Android device using my special link in the description below. And be sure to follow Fishing Clash on Instagram and Facebook, links are in the description to stay up to date on all of the latest news and events. And to sweeten the deal, I've got an exclusive gift for you. Use my code HOWTOBEAT when you download the game and you'll get a $20 welcome bonus, including a unique avatar and awesome gear. That's right, a free head start on your fishing journey. So what are you waiting for? Download Fishing Clash today. Use my code HOWTOBEAT and let's hit the water together. Thanks again to Fishing Clash for sponsoring today's video. And remember, download Fishing Clash using my link and code to claim your exclusive bonus. And now, back to the show. Monarch needs to get Emma, Madison, and most importantly, the Orca back into the right hands. And there's only one man for the job. Emma's ex-husband and former Monarch operative, Mark. Emma created the Orca by combining samples of the Titan's bioacoustic signatures, but they don't know exactly which ones that she's used. They need Mark to help them pin down the precise frequency. That way, they can locate the device and save Emma and Madison before it's too late. The team arrives at Castle Bravo, the top secret Monarch facility hidden under an oil rig off the coast of Bermuda. During a briefing with scientists and military personnel, they suspect that Jonah's next objective is to capture Mothra alive and sell her DNA on the black market. Mark, however, thinks that Mothra is only a decoy to distract them while the bad guys go for something even worse. His suggestion is to nuke all of the Titans back to Timbuktu, because that's the only way to guarantee that the Orca can never be used for evil. 
and they're about to find out just how right that he really is. It turns out that Jonah's real target is a monarch outpost somewhere in Antarctica, where his team makes quick work of the unprepared guards. There, they might find the most dangerous titan of all buried in the ice, a colossal, three-headed dragon known as Monster Zero. And now, he wants Emma to wake it up. Back at Castle Bravo, the entire station is suddenly put on high alert as their radar picks up an unexpected visitor coming in hot. It's Godzilla, and they can tell from his bioacoustics that something isn't right. The soldiers are ready to open fire, but as their expert on animal behavior, Mark actually suggests that they stand down since everyone, including Godzilla, knows it's a battle that they can't win. Instead, he convinces them that opening the shields will prove to Godzilla that they're not a threat and to their surprise, it actually works. It seems like Godzilla is trying to tell them something, and by projecting his movements, they're able to predict that he's headed for Antarctica next, which can only mean one thing. They're all about to be in big trouble if they don't act fast. With the monarch soldiers on their way, Jonah and his crew are forced to accelerate their plans. A gunfight quickly breaks out as the two forces clash in the outpost's tunnels. And when Mark sees that his wife and daughter are caught in the crossfire, he decides that he's going in. He ends up cornering them in a standoff on one of the elevated walkways. But all of a sudden, Emma activates the detonator, causing a chain of explosions that begins to collapse the entire base. In the chaos, Jonah is able to escape with Emma, Madison, and the Orca once again, while Mark is forced to give up the chase to save a team of soldiers who are about to be crushed by the falling ice. From their osprey high above the battlefield, Emma and Jonah use the Orca to wake up Monster Zero now that he's finally been set free. On the surface, Mark and the others can only watch as the three-headed monstrosity rises up from the depths of the Earth and begins destroying everything in sight. A few of the soldiers try to fight back, but the monster instantly disintegrates the entire squad with his gravity beams damaging Mark's aircraft in the process. It's about to be game over for the entire Monarch crew when suddenly Godzilla shows up to save their lives. Although he's clearly outmatched, Godzilla fearlessly charges into the fight, but ends up knocking the monarch Osprey towards the edge of a crevasse in the process. As a battle rages on, he charges up his atomic breath and fires a blast straight for his opponent's heads. Unfortunately, it's a miss, and the monster responds with its own burst of gravity beams, landing a critical hit straight to Godzilla's chest that sends him tumbling down into the crater. He was able to buy enough time for a squadron of fighter jets to arrive on the scene, and they distract the monster with a barrage of missiles that he deflects with his wings, launching Mark backwards through the air and knocking him unconscious. Before they have a chance to turn the tables, the monster unfurls its wings and disappears into the clouds, leaving the badly crippled Monarch team no closer to getting the situation under control. Okay, it's safe to say that didn't go well. I'd say it's officially time to start listening to Mark now. After all, he called this whole scheme almost immediately, but the rest of the Monarch crew made it all too easy for Jonah yet again, despite having all of the info that they needed to predict his next move. There was no need to waste time searching all around the world for Jonah because they already knew that he'd be going after another Titan. Instead, it would have been much easier to beef security up at all of the Monarch outposts and simply let Jonah come to them. To be fair, with 16 other titans at different points across the globe and in such short notice to get ready, I might be able to understand how they dropped the ball. But after they knew that Jonah was in Antarctica, Monarch really has no excuse for letting him get away again. First of all, why not immediately destroy or take control of Jonah's Osprey before confronting him so that he wouldn't be able to escape? Then, as soon as the ambush started, just pull back. They're literally underground, so it should have been easy enough for Monarch just to wait for them to come back up in the elevator, or cause a cave-in and bury Jonah's whole squad under the ice. Emma and Madison being caught in the middle makes things more complicated, but considering what's at risk here, all options should be on the table. They've been willing to nuke entire cities in the past to stop Godzilla, after all. 
Right now, they have Jonah trapped in Antarctica, the farthest away from civilization that you can go without being at the bottom of the ocean or in outer space. And you're telling me that now is when they decided to hold back all to protect two people? I get why, but the consequences of this choice are about to be so much worse. Since this is a monarch outpost, shouldn't they have some way to take remote control over parts of the station? If that's the case, then they could have cut the power to the whole place and left Jonah stuck in the dark, while also removing his ability to escape via elevator, or shut and locked any security doors down in the tunnels to keep them contained to one area. Even after the explosions started, Ghidorah still wasn't a threat until Emma had to stand right out in the open with the Orca to wake him up. So why not take her out while they had the chance? It should have been an easy enough shot for them to make, and would have avoided a lot of the bigger problems down the line. Even better, they could have brought a signal jammer or an EMP device to block the Orca's frequency, and stop Emma from broadcasting the signal in the first place. As for the Monarch troops, here's a crazy idea. How about running for your lives instead of just staring down into the crater like a bunch of deer caught in headlights? I don't know about you, but with a three-headed dragon about to come out of there, I'd have been halfway back to Bermuda by the time that these guys actually started to run. I'm all for trying to fight if it's possible, but one look at that thing should tell you that your standard rifles aren't going to cut it, and it would be better to get out of there while you could to fight another day. Which brings us to our villain, Monster Zero, or as we'll come to know him, King Ghidorah. This guy is as terrifying as it gets, standing at 521 feet tall. That's nearly as tall as the Washington Monument, and weighing in at a preposterous 140,000 tons. With a wingspan of approximately 1,300 feet, Ghidorah here is the most fearsome titan that the world has ever seen. Unlike Mothra, who's clearly an ally, or Godzilla and Kong, who fall somewhere in between, Ghidorah is straight up evil and kills humans not out of fear or a natural predatory instinct, but because he thinks that it's fun. Ghidorah here isn't interested in maintaining the natural order. He wants to take complete control and reshape the world for himself. And the worst part is that he's powerful enough to do it. Because the obvious threat presented by just his sheer massive size, he has the ability to regenerate from attacks that would be fatal to even Godzilla himself making him completely impervious to almost any form of damage. To boost his power, he's able to create and feed off of lightning storms due to his electro-receptive biology, and even has gold-plated skin to help with conduction. His massive wings make him extremely mobile, able to fly at speeds of about 575 miles per hour. Worst of all, Ghidorah is highly intelligent, as shown by his decision to let Godzilla charge up his atomic breath before immediately dodging and counteracting the blast, tricking his opponent into wasting his most powerful attack. Out of all Titans, only Godzilla is powerful enough to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ghidorah, so for now, it's a good thing that he's on our side and the Monarch crew needs to support him however they can. He doesn't have a lot of weaknesses, but one thing that we do know is that being frozen in the ice seemed to keep him contained. If Monarch could develop weapons that would allow them to freeze him again, then that should help to get the job done. We can also see that he's much more suited to fight on land or in the air. But in the water, Godzilla has the advantage. As part of their strategy, Monarch should attempt to lure Ghidorah over the water whenever possible to help Godzilla out. It's important to note that, although they're all part of the same creature, each of Ghidorah's three heads seem to have a different personality. Right now, it looks like the middle head is in control, based on how it was leading the others when he woke up. So if we're going to attack, I'd suggest targeting the leader first, as well as other potential weak points like his wings and underbelly. It's a long shot, but maybe there's a frequency that could turn the heads against each other and force Ghidorah here to fight himself. Ghidorah's greatest weapon is his gravity beams, but it looks like he needs to open his mouth to fire them. Perhaps they could find some way to seal his mouth shut with some extremely strong adhesives or wire, and that could take his gravity beams out of the picture at least until it wore off. Finally, it might be easier to focus on the human side of the problem. Jonah's a smart guy, but he still needs a team to do his dirty work. That team is made up of people who live on Earth, but his plan is going to destroy the Earth. Obviously, you can see how this might be a problem. There's no way that everyone in his crew is fully on board. So maybe there's a way that the Monarch team could turn Jonah's crew against each other. Even if they aren't able to stop him, any hitch in his plans would help buy the good guys more time to get things back under control. Mark eventually wakes up back on the Monarch command ship 
and he finds that they're already pursuing Emma towards another Titan containment site located on a small island just off the coast of Mexico. The researchers can't understand why Emma would be doing this, but just then, they receive a surprise call from none other than Mrs. Crazy Lady herself, and she wants to uh, explain her evil plan. It turns out that Emma here went off the deep end after the death of their son during Godzilla's fight with the Mudos, and as she researched the Titans to figure out how to stop them, she came to the realization that humanity itself is the disease, and the Titans are the cure. It's a classic depopulation scheme, but instead of searching for the Infinity Stones so that she could Thanos snap half of everyone out of existence, they've decided to let Monster Zero and his friends do their dirty work instead. Mark urges her to come to her senses, but the woman is already too far gone, and she leaves them with a warning to seek shelter before the real destruction begins. Tracing her call, the team suddenly realizes that Emma isn't really on the island at all. She's broadcasting from somewhere deep underground in one of the secret monarch bunkers, and she's just shut down the containment systems for the titan that's being held there. On the island, Monarch soldiers are already doing everything that they can to evacuate everyone as quickly as possible, but it's too late. Just then, an otherworldly shriek pierces the air as the nearby volcano suddenly erupts, and an enormous pedosaur-like monster emerges from the lava. It's Rodan, the fire demon, and like his name suggests, this one is not a friend. At the same time, the Monarch crew picks up Monster Zero making a beeline straight for the emergence site. Whatever business these two titans have with each other, it won't be good for the people still stuck on the ground. But that's when Mark here gets an idea. After getting Rodan's attention with a barrage of missiles, the Monarch jets quickly make a U-turn back out towards the open ocean, luring the bird into following them away from the city. The plan works like a charm but it isn't enough to completely protect the people on the ground, as even the act of Rodan simply flying overhead causes a devastating gust of wind that demolishes anything unlucky enough to be caught in its path down on the streets below. Okay, this avian abomination is called Rodan, and he's essentially a cross between a giant bird and a petrosaur a group of ancient flying reptiles who ruled the skies about 220 million years ago. He's clocking in at over 850 feet tall, weighs nearly 400,000 tons, and has an 870 foot wingspan, plus a large beak and razor sharp claws for attacking his chosen prey, making him a formidable foe all on his own. We can tell right away that Rodan is definitely not a friend, although he wasn't outwardly aggressive either until Monarch fired on him. This could have been another mistake, as there was no way to tell what he would have done if he wasn't provoked. But with Ghidorah on his way to fight, it was really the only way to relocate the battlefield away from the mainland and out to a safer distance from the city. Rodan may be a titan, but he's not an alpha, and instead falls in line with whoever the current alpha titan is. This means that there could be a way to use the orca to turn him against the other titans, and work as a teammate for the humans alongside Mothra and Godzilla. It's just an idea. The inside of Rodan's body is basically an active volcano, and he radiates heat that can reach about 1200 degrees Celsius. This makes him extremely resistant to high temperatures, and even Godzilla's thermonuclear attacks. Due to his bio-volcanic makeup, just getting too close to Rodan can be deadly for anyone who isn't a giant, nearly indestructible monster. All these years spent hibernating in a volcano have given Rodan's body the composition of molten rock, making him extremely durable and able to just shrug off anything that either the military or fellow titans can throw at him. He can also generate cyclone-like forces with his massive wings and fly as fast as a fighter jet while still maintaining some seriously impressive maneuverability for his size. Is Rodan as tough as Godzilla, Ghidorah, or Kong? Probably not, but with that being said, he's still definitely no pushover. In terms of fighting him, it would be smarter for the Monarch crew to have used drones instead of jets if possible. Because when you lose a fighter jet, you're not just losing the plane, but only the people with the skills to fly them. Rodan may not have many weaknesses, but his signature feature of being volcanic could also be the key to defeating him. When water touches lava, it eventually cools down until it forms into stone. 
This means that Monarch could use water to counter him, either by bringing in specifically designed aircraft like the kind that are used to fight forest fires, you know, by dumping massive amounts of water or fire suppressing chemicals onto him, or instead focus all of their fire on the membraneous section of his wings to knock him off balance and cause him to fall into the ocean. Rodan isn't the only threat on the board though, since they now know that Emma's greater plan is to unleash all of the Titans. Monarch should immediately evacuate any population centers near one of the containment sites so that the military can focus on responding to the attack instead of wasting time making sure that the civilians are safe. It's also important to note that just like Ghidorah, Rodan didn't wake up until he heard the broadcasts from the Orca, which means that they could have prevented this entirely by simply destroying the nearby radio towers before Emma sent out the signal. They also know that Emma is taking shelter in one of the underground Monarch bunkers. Since they are the ones that built them, they should already know where all the bunkers are. Monarch should immediately request help from the military to raid all of these locations, and they'd probably be able to get their hands on the Orca in a matter of just a few hours, bringing a stop to Emma's plan. At least it's good to see that they've finally come around to the idea of letting the monsters fight each other, but they're about to find out that Ghidorah here won't be going down so easily. With the bird in hot pursuit, the Monarch team sticks to the plan as he starts taking out their jets one at a time. A final barrel move from Rodan leaves only the Monarch command ship still in the sky, but for now, they've finally reached their target. They're headed straight for Monster Zero, and just as Rodan is about to grab them with his massive talons, the Monarch ship dives underneath the dragon, causing the Titans to collide in the air. As fearsome as Rodan is, he quickly proves to be no match for Monster Zero. With the dragon using its extra heads to hold him in place while blasting him point blank with a burst of his gravity beam, sending the bird tumbling down into the sea. Just then, the Monarch crew receives an urgent message from Admiral Stenz, ordering them to evacuate the area as quickly as possible. The military is about to unleash a prototype oxygen destroyer bomb that will eradicate any living thing caught within a two mile radius of the impact zone. This uh, isn't up for discussion. The bomb is already on its way, and all that they can do is get the hell out of there before it goes off. With Rodan out of the picture, Monster Zero turns his attention back towards the Monarch crew. But just as he's about to disintegrate everyone on board, Godzilla suddenly comes to the rescue, body slamming the dragon into the water and buying the good guys another chance to escape. Now that he's playing with a home field advantage, it looks like this is a fight that Godzilla actually stands a chance at winning. He's even able to rip one of the dragon's three heads completely off with a twist of his jaws. But before he can even finish the battle, the oxygen destroyer strikes, causing an explosion so powerful that it makes an atomic bomb look like a bottle rocket. For a moment, it looks like the fight is over, until suddenly to the horror of everyone watching, Monster Zero emerges from the water with a victorious shriek, one head shorter than he was before, but otherwise unharmed. Godzilla, on the other hand, took the brunt of the impact, and as the Monarch crew listens in from their ship, he flatlines. The King of Monsters is dead and now Monster Zero is officially in control. Landing atop the volcano, he sprouts a new head like a lizard growing back its tail, and lets out a powerful roar, signaling to all of the other titans that there's a new king in town. All across the globe, the hibernating titans suddenly begin to wake up and escape from containment, answering the dragon's call and submitting to him as their new leader. Okay, haven't they learned by now that every time they try to resolve the situation by out-violencing the Titans, they only end up making things worse? They've got me feeling like that fish from SpongeBob over here, wondering how many times we have to teach them this lesson. There's only one way to describe what we just witnessed here. Uh, Monarch, you kind of f***ed up. All right, let's put the fact that they just accidentally killed their only chance at stopping Ghidorah on hold for a minute and talk about how they could have stopped things from ever getting to this point in the first place. Monarch has to be one of the most incompetent top secret organizations that I've ever seen. How come Emma, an employee of Monarch, 
can shut down the Titan containment systems from a bunker on the other side of the planet, but Monarch themselves can't do anything to stop that. You mean to tell me that they have no plans in place whatsoever for what would happen if someone hacked into their systems and tried to release these world-destroying creatures? That's the first thing that they should have figured out. Instead, they left it up to the military who spent all of their time making an oxygen bomb that destroys all living things within a two-mile radius. Because I guess nuking their own cities just wasn't destructive enough. Call me crazy, but wouldn't it have made more sense to have reliable methods in place for fending off attacks and keeping the monsters safely contained so that you never ended up in this situation to begin with? This time, the bad guys even spelled out their plans for them and they still did nothing to prevent it. Even something as simple as deactivating the radio towers that they knew Emma was going to use to broadcast the signal would have done the trick. The worst part is that Godzilla had it, with one head down and two more to go, but they intervened exactly at the wrong moment and in the worst way imaginable. I guess that we might as well get used to our new three-headed dragon overlord now that Monarch just killed the only thing capable of protecting us from him and handed Ghidorah the keys to the planet. Maybe one day they'll finally figure out that the only answer is to let Godzilla handle his business, but for now, Monarch, it looks like you f***ed up. So at this point, things aren't looking too good for humanity. But there's one last Titan who might prove to be our friend. After escaping from containment when this whole disaster first began, Mothra had cocooned herself beneath a waterfall deep in the heart of the Yunnan rainforest. Suddenly, the cocoon begins to pulse with blue energy and starts drawing glowing space dust down from the night sky as Mothra emerges in her final form, sporting a pair of gargantuan new wings. Meanwhile, back on board the Monarch command ship, Dr. Chen has managed to dig up some game-changing information about our friend Monster Zero. It turns out that he's actually not from our planet at all, but rather a member of an ancient extraterrestrial species. His true name is King Ghidorah, and in the past, Godzilla was the only Titan powerful enough to keep him in check. Now that he's awakened once again, Ghidorah has gone back to his goal of reshaping the Earth into his own personal kingdom, and they've just killed their only hope of stopping him. Now that the military are handling things, Mark decides that he's going to try and save his daughter while he still can. Just then, he notices a huge burst of sunlight breaking through the clouds as Ghidorah's storm begins to dissipate. It's Mothra, and it seems like she's trying to communicate with Godzilla. To everyone's surprise, it actually works, and Godzilla's heart starts to beat again. But it's going to be a while before he returns to his full power. Thinking quickly, Mark realizes that there might be a way for them to help. Here's the plan. While one half of the Monarch crew attempts to lure Ghidorah back from the mainland. The other half are going to take a submarine down to where Godzilla is hiding and feed him a nuke to accelerate his regeneration. It's a long shot and not to mention incredibly dangerous, but everyone knows that it's their only chance to stop the dragon. The plan starts off smoothly enough until all of a sudden, the Monarch sub is caught in an inescapable underwater vortex and dragged even farther into the depths below. When they finally come to a stop, they realize that they've found their way into one of the tunnels below the Earth that Godzilla uses to get around. It turns out that there's a whole city down there that looks like it predates even ancient Egypt, with enormous stone statues all over the place in Godzilla's honor. Checking the scanners, they pick up a massive blob of radiation just over the next ridge which must be where Godzilla is hiding out. They eventually come to a point where the radiation is too intense for them to get any closer, and even their unmanned drones are having trouble getting through. One of the drones briefly manages to get a look inside of the cave, and just before it shorts out, they spot Godzilla regenerating at the top of a huge stone pyramid feeding off of the natural radiation to restore his power. It looks like Godzilla can take care of himself, but there's just one problem. The regeneration process could take years. While they only have a couple of hours before Ghidorah and his minions destroy all other life on Earth, 
their only choice is to send in the nuke to speed up the process. But to make matters even worse, their weapons systems were badly damaged during the crash, leaving them with no way to launch it. This means that someone is going to have to hand deliver the weapon straight to Godzilla, and Dr. Sarazawa barely decides to volunteer for the job, knowing without a doubt that it's going to be a one-way trip. Okay, putting aside the fact that they've just found the lost city of Atlantis for one moment, Monarch really needs to come up with another plan, if at all possible. He's brave for volunteering, but Dr. Sarazawa is just too important of a resource to allow him to go through with this. Instead, they should consider trying to fit the weapon with a longer timer and sending it on an unmanned submarine. The radiation may fry their electronics if they get too close, but when they sent them in before, one of the drones was able to make it all the way into Godzilla's cave before shorting out. If those were the only three that they had on the ship, then maybe they made a huge mistake by sending them in at all at the same time and wasting some of their most useful tools. The good news is that they still have the sub that Sarazawa is about to use, and it shouldn't be too hard for the world's top scientists to refit the sub to be piloted remotely in the same way as a drone. To be fair, it would take a little more time, but it's worth it to try any other solution before they sacrifice their most knowledgeable guy. The only problem is that the electronics of the drones are damaged by the high radiation when they get too close. In the future, they should work on designing drones that have their electrical components with lead shielding or other materials to protect them from ionizing radiation. This would interfere with the radio frequency signals needed to control it, but I'm sure they could figure out a way to boost those signals while giving a little extra protection to the rest of the drone's electrical components. In the meantime, there's another strategy that I would consider working on. Mark here already knows how to make another Orca device. The only thing that they haven't figured out is how Emma came up with the alpha frequency that calms them down. Why not try building another Orca and combining Ghidorah's and Godzilla's frequencies to make a super alpha frequency and get the other Titans to stand down, or even better, turn them all against Ghidorah and overwhelm him? There's no way to tell if it actually would work, but at this point, I don't see a good reason not to try. Suiting up, Sarazawa hands Mark his notes and climbs aboard a small one-man sub. He knows that he's headed for certain death, but it's the only way. The radiation is starting to take its effect by the time that he gets to the other side. Pressing through, he carries the heavy warhead all the way to the top of the pyramid and activates the timer. With only one minute until detonation, Sarazawa comes face to face with Godzilla for the last time, thanking him as the warhead explodes and the shockwave launches the Monarch sub back up to the surface. Moments later, Godzilla rises up from the depths, looking more powerful than ever, and quickly turns back towards the mainland, leaving Mark and the others unharmed. Now it's time to settle the score. Meanwhile, in the skies over the flooded capital, the other half of the Monarch team are busy hitting Ghidorah and Rodan with everything that they've got, but nothing seems to even leave so much as a scratch on either of them. The situation looks hopeless, but then all of the other Titans around the world suddenly stop their attacks and become docile, with no one sure exactly why. After hearing her mother and Jonah arguing, Madison decided to take matters into her own hands. Grabbing the Orca, she snuck out of the bunker and into the military outpost at the nearby baseball stadium, where she began to broadcast the alpha frequency through the speakers there, temporarily calming the rampaging Titans, except for Rodan and Ghidorah himself. From the roof of the stadium, Madison notices the wind abruptly change direction as a massive storm is brewing on the horizon. It's Ghidorah, looking for the source of the signal, and he is not happy. The dragon immediately destroys the stadium's speakers, but when that doesn't stop the broadcast, he begins blasting everything in sight with his gravity beams furious that anyone would challenge his authority. Somehow, Madison actually manages to avoid being killed by his attacks or the falling debris. But when a strike from Ghidorah's gravity beam knocks her off of her feet, she's forced to throw the Orca as a distraction, and he crushes the device under his massive paw. Instead of leaving, Ghidorah then turns his attention back to Madison, recognizing that she was the one responsible. There's nowhere for her to run, but just when she's about to be vaporized, Godzilla shows up to save the day, knocking Ghidorah back with a blast of his atomic breath. 
Okay, it's officially time for the final showdown. If Godzilla goes down this time, then it's bye-bye to all life on the planet as we know it. So Monarch needs to make sure that they back him up and pull out all the stops to guarantee that this fight goes our way. They may not have the Orca, but now they know how Emma created the Alpha Frequency that can control the other Titans. It's not like she had access to any kind of technology or materials that Monarch doesn't. So this brings us back to what we said before. Just make another device. Then, instead of telling the other Titans to stand down, they could turn them against Ghidorah and provide Godzilla with some handy meat shields while he finishes the job. Godzilla was almost able to take Ghidorah on his own the last time that they met, and now he's going to be getting help from Mothra. The only problem is that she's just not that powerful in a fight, but if they had help from even one more Titan like Rodan or any of the others, that should turn the battle to Godzilla's favor in a major way. Besides that, if they have any other weapons that they've been holding out on, like those energy cannons on Castle Bravo, it's time to break them out. They need to do absolutely everything that they can to back Godzilla up before Ghidorah destroys the entire planet. The attack knocks Ghidorah off of his feet, and this time, Godzilla and the military have finally learned to work together. Taking the lead, the Monarch jets unload on the dragon with everything in their arsenal, distracting him while Godzilla charges in for the kill. It looks like they've managed to turn the tables, but as always, there is a problem. Sarazawa's plan worked a little bit too well, and now Godzilla is only minutes away from going thermonuclear and unleashing an atomic blast that will destroy everything for miles around. They need to find Madison and the Orca, and get the hell out of Boston before the big guy glasses the entire city. They're about to recover the device, banged up but still in one piece. As for Madison, she's nowhere in sight. Mark's Osprey is destroyed during the fight, but just then, Emma shows up in a stolen Humvee and shouts for them to get in. She's had a change of heart for now that she's seen what Ghidorah is really capable of. And as they're speeding away from the battlefield, they suddenly realize that Madison must have gone back to their old house. Meanwhile, Godzilla is holding his own, but Ghidorah is still more than a match for him, even with his newfound strength. As the battle rages on, Mothra suddenly emerges from the clouds, webbing Ghidorah to the side of a skyscraper as Godzilla tackles him straight through the building. She circles around for another take, but gets intercepted by Rodan, briefly taking her out of the fight while she deals with this new threat. Realizing that he's losing the battle, Ghidorah decides to chomp down on an active power station, flooding his body with energy and increasing his strength to match Godzilla's. At the same time, Rodan pins Mothra down and is about to finish her off, but she dodges his attack and stabs him through the chest with a hidden stinger, taking him out of the fight. Grabbing Godzilla with his tails, Ghidorah knocks him unconscious before lifting him up high into the atmosphere and dropping him thousands of feet back to the ground. It's a devastating attack, and for a moment, it looks like the fight is over. Seeing her friend in trouble, Mothra rushes in to protect him, but Ghidorah disintegrates her with his beam. The dust falls down onto Godzilla, renewing his strength but it's going to be a minute before he's back on his feet. By the time that they get there, Mark and Emma find their old house completely destroyed, with Madison having taken cover in the bathtub. Luckily, she's still alive, but none of them will be for long unless they get out of the city. Thinking quickly, they manage to repair the Orca, knowing that their only hope is to lure Ghidorah away long enough for Godzilla to recover. As they board their Osprey, Emma realizes that she has to stay behind, taking the Orca in her Humvee and distracting Ghidorah so that Mark and Madison can escape. The plan works, and while Ghidorah is chasing after Emma, Godzilla goes full thermonuclear, unleashing a blast of energy that sears off the dragon's wings. Stepping down on his chest, Godzilla erupts in an explosion so powerful that the only thing left when the dust clears is a single one of the dragon's heads that he destroys from the inside with a burst of his atomic breath. Just then, the other titans converge on the scene, with each one, including Rodan, bowing down to Godzilla as the Alpha once again. With Ghidorah defeated, the true king of the monsters has returned, but it won't be long before another threat rises up to challenge him for the crown. But what would you do? I don't even know what I would do. I would just run. Run, 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 far away, grab a bag full of DVDs, a DVD player, a flat screen, a shovel, 
dig a tunnel underground and live there for a little while and catch up on the OC instead of doing anything that has to do with Titans on Earth. I just, I, I'm just not that dude. But let me know down in the comments what you would do. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out that How to Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. I'll see you on the next video and have a damn good day.